Kill a man, and you're a murderer. Kill thousands, and you're a conqueror. Kill everyone, and you're a god, Paul said. Elizabeth said, I don't think God exists. Paul replied, We shall see. Recognize this quotes movie? Stay tuned to find out or check out the title of this episode of Talking Pictures Trivia. Welcome to Talking Pictures Trivia, the podcast in which a group of geographically challenged friends explore movies through trivia as an excuse to keep their friendships alive. I'm one of these friends and today's host, Nick, and with me is... Tom and KJ. Additionally, joining us as a guest this week is... Kevin. Thanks for joining us. Kevin has joined us for Rams, Kundun, Treasure of the Sierra Madre, and a few others. Kevin still conveniently likes movies. For those joining us for the first time, we start off each episode with a movie quiz, as these pivotal questions will determine who earns today's trivia crown. In round one, each question is worth one point, and in round two, each question is worth two points. Right, Tom? We'll see. Then, once the fierce competition is over, we followed up with our famous movie rant where anything goes. Tom, tell us about today's movie. Walking up to theaters in 1966, we would have had to choose between Batman the Movie, Monster Go Home, The Bible, and today's movie, Masculine Feminine. Okay, so Masculine Feminine is a Godard film, and it's kind of the beginning of his, I guess what people refer to as his middle period. And we see uh, Jean-Pierre Léo as Paul, who is a, a, a Parisian cafe goer. And he falls for a young singer, Madeline Zimmer, played by uh, Chantel Goya. And it is about their relationship. It's about um, Paul's life in Paris at this time. It's about Paris in the mid 60s. He has a, a friendship with uh, Robert. Um, he becomes friends and ends up living with Madeline and her roommates and encounters a number of kind of odd things that happen in Paris. He gets involved in politics. Um, we see him get involved in the lives of the people around him. To say this movie has a very uh, eventful plot might be speaking too strongly. Really, it's about these people and their faces and their experience and this sort of energy of being young in a time of transition. I'll be your questionnaire tonight, delivering you handcrafted questions. But first, Nick, if you only had one word to describe masculine feminine, what would it be? Snooze fest. Kevin? We. Oui. And KJ? Ça va. And my word would be disconnected. It's time for question one. Okay, so we'll start with our first question, which will be a nice, a nice softball right over the plate. Who are they the children of? Locked in. Locked in? I was going to preemptively lock in, but I had nothing. Locked in. I may have, I may have found it. I may have found it. All right, Nick, what do you have? Children of the Revolution. Okay, KJ, what do you have? Le Révolution. Okay, Kevin, what do you have? Marx and Coca-Cola. All right, and Kevin gets it. Yep, in fact, in one of our intertitles, and this became kind of synonymous with the film, they are the children of Marx and Coca-Cola. All right, and gentlemen, the questions are going to get harder from here on out. <laughs> so, a nice little softball. I'm, I'm sorry in advance. Um, but this, this is an intertitle at one point that Godard puts in to describe these characters. And in kind of the literature about this movie, the reviews about this movie, this intertitle is mentioned all the time as, the, as kind of encapsulating what this movie is about. It's about these people who are at the intersection of these kind of political ideologies and the um, 
what's happening in pop culture. They're very up on pop culture and what's happening in kind of youth culture. And I was wondering what what people thought about that intersection, that kind of those two sides of what gives these young people energy. This is where I think I had a problem with this film because I've seen people like this in my life when they're young and they're just getting out of school and they have all these ideas and they're gonna change the world and really they end up being a bunch of deadbeats that never do anything. Maybe they do a little spray painting like he does. So I had trouble buying that taking real life few years later out of the picture. I don't know if he's like, well, actually based on the movie, he's not that guy, he doesn't get there. But that I think was one of my biggest hurdles is why do I care about these people? I mean, I, I, I took that as sort of like, um, I, I think um, Paul is, is the, the kind of the child of Marx, right? And uh, Madeline is, is the child of Coca-Cola. Even though in the film she said Pepsi Cola, she likes. Pepsi. <laughs> uh, <laughs> is that a question? I got that one. <laughs> uh, but I also think it's interesting because I think what they're trying to say, or or what uh, Godard is is trying to say, these these people are also kind of hypocritical in their naivete. Yes. yes. Um, that that it's like, oh, I love Coke, but you know, revolution all the way, and uh, you know. Let's uh, let's talk about how Charles de Gaulle is uh, this terrible person for being this awful capitalist and, and all that kind of crap. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't really have a whole lot of insight beyond that. But it, yeah, it's an interesting, interesting thing because you can you can kind of especially with with Paul, he kind of seems kind of hypocritical from the beginning. I feel like Madeline has sort of embraced her Coca-Cola, um, but but maybe Paul isn't sure whether he's marks or coca-cola at least at the beginning well she's really successful right she's got the magazine she's got an album that's like number six in japan or something i think yeah number four is it tom Tom number three yeah number three which actually was true of the actress at the time she had a number three album that's interesting yeah yeah uh (laughs) sean yeah chantelle goya was she has an interesting story i'll i'll i don't mean to interrupt you but Please no, I, and I was just going to say, and then he was asking questions to people, right? I, I couldn't tell if that was a professional thing or if that was just he, his curiosity. He worked at the magazine and he switched to kind of like, um, he was a, a surveyor for this organization. He, he sort of has like a, a drifter vibe, right? Like he just got out of the military. He's trying to find a job. He gets a job and then decides he doesn't like it and then gets this other job where, you know, it, he's asking people polling questions and you know i don't know like it doesn't seem like he has any kind of direction he doesn't doesn't have any kind of ambition but he's um, going to change the world kevin but but he but, change- he but he hates the world he lives in you know like it's you know it's so he wants things to change but he's not going to do anything to bring it about besides spray painting spray paint stuff yeah i i, I don't i suppose i don't find the sort of Marx and Coca-Cola thing to be necessarily contradictory. In a certain way, it is, because one is a enormous capitalist enterprise and the other is Marx. Socialism, <laughs> yeah, like that's the battle here. Criticizing it. Part of it seems to be, though, that it's it's culture, what's hip, and part of what's hip is also kind of what's political, right? And... um and so being kind of a young revolutionary, regardless of if you're a particularly effective revolutionary or, you know, just kind of going along to get along, um, that seems to be part of what this scene is about. Um, and there is, there are stakes, right? So they have like the, a part of this too is that this was made during the, the 1965 election. So there, there is this, uh, which is the first direct election since 1848 in France at that time. Um, which also featured uh, uh, De Gaulle. De Gaulle was uh, opened up the election for uh, a direct election, which he then proceeded to win. Um, so there is something happening. It isn't necessarily just entirely vapid, um, but I, I do see where you're coming from. Where it's like he's not really he's he's kind of more of a drifter, right? He feels like. Um, 
he feels like a like a William S. Burroughs character more so than an actual organizer of people for for a socialist purpose. Um, he's he's not you know partaking in political events or organizing things or writing anything. He's talking to random people on the street and being like, "Yeah, you like capitalism? You're the kind of person who would like capitalism, aren't you?" You know, like it, it's it's revolutionary in thought maybe, but the the mm-hmm. actions are. I don't want to say anything but, but they're not particularly effective. Yeah, he's, it strikes me as it's a, it's the culture he's in, as opposed to, you know, he is a, a participant or failing to participate in, in some sort of revolution. It's just part of, it seems to be like, that's what that world is. It's, it's Coca-Cola and Marx, right? They're listening to the hippest music, the most recent music, which is, of course, some kind of capitalist. <laughs> but it's put out there by some some kind of organization with some capital in order to do that. Um, but they're also, you know, talking about socialism and about um, uh, it, its evolution in, in France and the election and the Vietnam War and all these things. Um, so I, yeah, I, I guess I don't, I don't really necessarily see the hypocrisy um, in the sense that I don't know that Paul ever posits himself as like a revolutionary. I think it's just what people were talking about. That's more the thing I get, right? Like this is what people were interested in. I don't want to like make this go on forever, but he is like scribbling his thoughts on things. Like he is actually not just talking about it but to him he thinks that's going to make a difference or his attempt so he doesn't take some action but it's not very meaningful in my opinion yeah i don't think yeah i I don't think he's doing anything meaningful right i think he also just only cares about madeline (laughs) you know he cares about Madeline. that he thinks he's doing something meaningful but it's all nonsense (laughs) I, I think if you were to ask him, are you a participant in the, you know, active counterculture, he would say yes. Mm-hmm. And then you would say, okay, well, what are you doing? And he would say, well, you know, I'm, I'm I, uh, you know, I'm part of the movement. Mm-hmm. And that would be like his way of participating. It's like, yeah, I, I guess that's fair. But, you know, if you really believe this is sitting there believing really an act of of uh defiance or is it uh you know is it sitting there doing nothing it's time for question two what is masculine what is feminine that's two questions i'll give you extra points if you get them both so one point they're sitting yep uh paul and robert are, are speaking and they say what is masculine what is feminine locked in i don't really want to say it though you don't okay yeah yeah i'm gonna lock in and abstain too nick i think that's a good idea i think we got the answer wrong Nick, because tom doesn't seem to understand what we're talking about uh i'll i'll lock in sure okay what do you got uh i can remember a vague reference to um them saying something about music being feminine. I could be off base here, but I, I, re- I vaguely remember the conversation and, and that's essentially all I have for that. I, I don't remember at all what was masculine. Uh, so I'll throw out um, cigarettes. I don't know. Uh, KJ, what do you have? Yeah, as I said, I, I, I think I want to abstain and then use my time to just kind of say, this movie was really sexist. So... It was a bit of a tough watch. I understand it was made in the '60s, um, but you know, there's a lot going on there. I, I, I don't expect to necessarily explore that here on Talking Pictures Trivia because it's not really a platform for, um, you know, exploring uh, big social issues. But um, that's my answer. All right, Nick, what do you have? Okay, they're dissecting the words themselves, and something about masculine starts with mask and then they make a joke about and in other words the bottom <laughs> and then um the female side is nothing all right and nick gets it yeah yeah it's 
I, I was surprised. You were, mask and ass is what he says. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was it ass? Is are we not supposed to say that? No, I, I mean you I can, that, but yeah, yeah, yeah you can. <laughs> but just, there's many ways to say it. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was an. I thought I thought that was an acceptable. Like that's a television curse word. You could say that on. No, television. no, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> It just doesn't fit my experience on talking pictures. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think Masking. I think uh, um, I think ass is okay as long as you're referring to like someone is an ass. If you're referring mm -hmm. to a physical uh, butt, I think that is not okay. On TV. Yeah. yeah, it's. I think it's a person or a mule. It's acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so but I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure if that was the sequence you were looking for <laughs> when we first had that like hesitancy there. So yeah. I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I got the points, but at least I narrowed it down. Yeah, nope, that's right. That's mask and ask, and then they, he asks him well, what is feminine, and he has he has nothing. He says nothing. He gets nothing out of that word. Um, and so this point, talking about the the title and how it connects these these men, when we focus really on. Um, Paul more than anything, and, and Robert is a, a bit secondary. Um, but their attempt, especially Paul's attempt to connect to Madeline, and then we have uh, Robert's attempt to um, to connect to, I think it's uh, Marlene is who he's trying to, to go out with. Um, no, I'm sorry, he's not trying to go out with Marlene. He's trying to go out with uh, Catherine Isabel. That's right. He's trying to go out with Catherine Isabel. Um, I, I, especially taken by that real distance that exists between Paul and Madeline, which I find incredibly compelling. Um, I, you know, I think this uh, idea of like men are these kind of joke, you know, they're joking. They're just saying men are, are asses or whatever. <laughs> they're, they're asses. Um, but they have no way, these young men, no way to describe women. They, 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 they can't even make a pun on the word. Um, and I think that reflects in the movie. There's this just gap between the genders that happens. Um, and I was wondering what people thought of that. Yeah, I don't know. That's, that's a tough one. It's a tough mm -hmm. one to, to talk about without, again, kind of going back to what KJ said and, and, uh, and, and talking about how, you know, the, the, the gender norms as portrayed in this movie are um, somewhat offensive to the, to the, to the modern um, modern contemplation of, of what those gender norms are or should be. Um, I think, you know, clearly Paul thinks of, of, of women in general as, as somewhat vapid. Um, and I, I think, I think he may be projecting a little bit. That's, that's my stance on it. Um, but yeah, I, I guess that's, that's essentially uh, all I have on, on that particular topic without delving too far into uh you know big social issues and that's fine my biggest challenge when discussing this film is i didn't care about any of the characters so it's really hard for me to dissect all these themes and i, I don't want to blow up the episode or anything but it's it's hard for me because i could care less about any of them like i just well, didn't you relate. don't yeah you don't you don't know anything about the women and i think that's by design um and I, I, I don't, I don't, I think what you know about the men is shockingly little um, as well. And narrow, very narrow. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I, I think I, I agree that these characters are kind of not relatable um, beyond, hey, I was an angsty kid one time too, who was uh, chasing girls and was, was unsuccessful for the vast majority of the time. Uh, but, but beyond that, yeah, it's tough to relate to, it's tough to relate to Paul for sure. Um, in a lot of ways. And then you don't, you don't know enough about any of the other characters, I think, to, to relate to them particularly well. I think where I connected with, with Paul in this is that, um, it, it's true. I think that, yeah, there, there's sort of a, um, you know, like Paul and Robert talk about, politics or music or, or whatever um, in a fairly shallow way, yes, but they do that. And mostly you see the women, you know, kind of putting on makeup. Um, but I, I think with where I connected to, to Paul with this was there's this, 
way in which we kind of don't ever get underneath Madeline's skin, right? She's this kind of person who he's in love with, who he, he proposes marriage to at one point, and he doesn't seem to be able to read her, and we don't be we don't, we don't seem to be able to read her either. You know, she has uh, an interest in her career. She's clearly career driven in terms of her her music, um, but it's hard to see. Um, outside the fact that she's she's very charming, um, what she's interested in Paul for, if she is at all, right? She seems almost like a blank space. Like there's there's this sort of um, in, in, impossible gap between her and Paul, and that's what I found really intriguing about the, their relationship in this movie, is that there's this um, she's impenetrable. He can't, you know, he can't get to her and every time it seems like she's just completely distant uh she'll sit next to him in the theater and say i love you and you know he'll light up a little bit and he doesn't really seem to know how to handle that because he's deeply immature um maybe he's 21 you know who who isn't uh but that i i thought was really really interesting and i think it connected to the title to me in a big way that it almost seemed to posit this is just this gap between these two groups of people between paul and um and these women especially between paul and madeline right like he just he can't get to her i i think from paul's perspective he can't get to her because there's nothing to get to and you know clearly that's um an oversimplification of of who she is as a person but you also have um the, the one scene where, um, I, I forget Madeline's uh, friend's name, who refers to a conversation that she had with Madeline. And, you know, it seems like a real conversation that these two women were having. And Paul has no idea how to even approach that conversation. And she's, she's saying like, oh, well, Madeline told me this. And he said like, no, she didn't, because she doesn't talk about those things. Clearly, she does talk about those mm -hmm. things, just not with Paul. All right. So here we are at the end of round one. And we have Nick and Kevin tied with a point apiece. And KJ is right behind with zero points. We will see you in round two. Hello. And, and welcome, welcome back to B-Side. Welcome back to B-Side. B -side. B -side. Finally, it is B-Side. Today we're going to be talking about Close Encounters of the Third Kind. We're going to be discussing the famous W.F. Murnau film from 1927, Sunrise. The Icelandic movie from 2015, Rams. Juzo Itami's 1985 picture, Tam Popo. And today I'm going to be talking about a good old film that we just covered, and this is 1984's Ghostbusters. Talking Pictures Trivia B-Side, wherever you listen to Talking Pictures Trivia. And we're back. We're at the critical point of our episode where we ask the guest a key question. If you could write your own sequel for Masculine Feminine, what would it be, Kevin? Uh, so, so clearly there's a lot of open ends um, at the end of this movie. And I, I think um, an interesting take would be to see how Madeline does in future relationships, if she's learned anything from this, or if she comes at relationships from a different angle um, because of this experience or simply because of maturity. I think you sort of have this, this youthful standoffishness about her. And it'd be interesting to see if that's just part of her personality or if that's youth or if that's, um, you know, gender norms in France in the mid sixties. And, uh, you know, she just doesn't feel comfortable being a real person. Uh, and if, if she grows out of that, um, as an outgrowth of th this election and, uh, you know, the, the 68 protests and things like that. Um, so I guess, you know, a sequel, a vague notion of a sequel would be some future version of Madeline, um, 
presumably in some form of romantic relationship. See, I was going to focus on Madeline, but I'm going in a completely different direction. I think she killed him. And this is the first in a line of many killings. By day, she is a pop star singer. And by night, she is a serial killer. So we got crime, thriller, drama, horror, <laughs> Get them all in there together and make a completely different movie as far removed from the flow and feel of this one as possible. Murdering feminine. <laughs> or murdering masculine. <laughs> she kills all the men. <laughs> I think they did make that. It's called uh, Sorry, Married an Axe Murderer, right? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. It's time for question three. What does Paul spray paint on the back of the cinema? And if you don't remember it, I will also accept what he spray paints in the bathroom in the cinema. Locked in. Were there subtitles for this? Or are we looking for the French word? I'm trying to... There was for the one in the bathroom for sure, and I don't remember. It. Oh, okay. Yes, I can remember the one in the I, bathroom. I can give a, a big, big hint, I think, that oh, answers I, that question. I I think I, I I think I'm I'm back on I'm locked in. It's just escaping me. I remembered it the bathroom one, but I'm gonna have to lock in. All right, Nick, what do you have? Go away or I shall taunt you a second time. Oh, all right. KJ, what do you have? So this was the homophobic section of the movie where he wrote coward, I believe was the key word what, that was uh, graffitied onto the walls. E coward, what? Okay. Uh, and Kevin, what do you have? Uh, so he, he starts to spray paint Charles de Gaulle equals, and I don't believe they show you what he equals, but I would assume it's something not flattering uh, at the movie theater. And then... Uh, the uh, the bathroom one, I remember it some, being something about the coward state, or it's it's not that the the the, the individuals in that scene are cowardly. It's that he thinks that there's something cowardly about the culture or the government or something along those lines. Uh, all right, very good. Yeah, uh, I'll give it to KJ too. He spray paints um, down with Republican cowards. Yeah, yeah and it. and then have uh, anything and then, to do with what happened right before that? When in the I didn't take that as a I, yeah scene I I so, it seemed like sort of random chaos like it seemed like he was sort of all over the place because and he does spray on the on the wall in the back de Gaulle right I and mean, he seemed I mean maybe I'm reading it wrong but it did seem more against yeah. the government than. But but it is weird that it just happened after that scene, mm. KJ. So I don't understand it, but I didn't I, take it that So way. I, I was playing that scene in my head and thinking, why would he open that door in the first place? And I think I came up with, I think he wanted to check to see what was in there because he was scared that he was going to get caught writing that. And then he opens the door and goes, those people clearly don't care. I'm going to write whatever <laughs> I want here mm -hmm. and, and and no one's going to care so it, I, it's yeah he didn't seem phased by it they were more upset that he was uh like taking a look I, what they were doing I, you know i like, think he was yeah. sort of like i'm gonna take this stand and, and do something you know subversive but he was also cowardly enough to check and make sure he wasn't gonna get caught first there's also when he's writing de, de gaulle he also runs into a couple hugging next to the the wall i didn't know what was going yeah. on there they were like frozen in a very compromised yeah. situation and, <laughs> and it was just right after the the i love you when madeline tells him i love you it seemed like there was this sort of transfer of this sort of libidinal energy into these like political kind of vague political slogans um you know, there seemed to be a mixing there of this kind of sexual energy uh, and this um, this this kind of political stuff. Because also the movie is highly sexual. They're watching, which they're disgusted by. Yeah, yeah. That was yeah. very graphic. That was, mm -hmm. that was that was tough to watch. That actually, was probably the most graphic part of the whole. Yeah, film. which they're they're 
you know, they seem to be, or he anyway is revolted by, he comes back in the movie and they see that. And it's one of the roommates seems to. Only one is into it, but they're just kind of, but Paul especially just kind of closes his eyes. Um, And yeah, so there seems to just be this kind of inability to deal with lust or something that's going on in that scene it's it's a very odd scene and i was wondering what people thought of that of that sequence because it's also the sequence where he goes in and corrects the format ratio in, in the in the um in the projectionist's office because he doesn't like how the how the thing is being formatted <laughs> they have the, wrong, the format. wrong format and they're also like playing they're trading seats like they keep switching where they sit who sits next to who we're all uncomfortable even in the movie yeah, they're they're, yeah, like Paul is a clearly deeply uncomfortable that everything in this scene. I was wondering what people thought of that. I, th- I think Paul has a has an anti-socialness to him that he sort of misplaces into anti-government. Like I, I think he's deeply uncomfortable with relating to people and that he sort of sees the government or culture in general as as sort of the thing that he's going to direct his um uh misanthropy i guess towards if, if that makes sense yeah yeah i i i i don't know if i go so far as to say misanthropy i i think he's socially stupid <laughs> certainly <laughs> you know i don't think he um is the most intelligent when it comes to kind of social relation, you know, re- relating to people socially. Um, Would we say he's an ass? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> I mean, he's he's, t- he's a 21 year old it's, dude, it's like who tough, isn't an it's ass. It's tough to tell if he's significantly worse than other men in mid sixties France, right? Like by, by my standards, yeah, he's a, he's a complete jerk. You know, the way he treats women in particular is unforgivable, but is that just, dating at the time and place i don't i don't know i think it's his whole vibe though like i said earlier he's got that element going on then he thinks he's this big revolutionary but really doesn't do anything it's it's the whole essence of who he is there's nothing there he's a young person right i think that's what what no, but it's not just a young person. There are young people who have it and are with it and are respectful and all that. He is another degree on well, all he's, of those he's clearly not that, right? But yeah, to, to Tom's point, um, misanthropic is, is probably a bridge too far. Uh, I think immature and erudite and um, all, all those types of words fit. Um, but is is he a is he a genuine jerk like like if you had the baseline level jerk in in uh 1965 france would he be more than a standard deviation away i i i really don't or know are they all jerks that's, that's what i mean it's like <laughs> everybody in this movie seems to be a jerk you have the you have the the uh the sexual assault on on in the film you have the guy who basically um, insults his wife and then tries to take their kid. You have, you know, you have various examples of men just being awful people, and it's, you know, well, that woman did shoot him sure, too, right? Sure. Like, so mm-hmm. there's the questionable things on all. Yeah, parties right. Here. I think which speaks to like <laughs> is is everyone just a jerk? Um, and certainly, my my experience in Charles de Gaulle Airport would lead me to believe that everyone in France is in fact a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> and we lost France. <laughs> I don't know if we ever had friends. But... Yeah, I don't I don't find um, Paul to be out of time. Right. I, I think one of the reasons why I thought this movie would be good for that era or this era, whatever, whatever we're titling this block, is that he seems to be of his error. And he seems to be of this time period, of this kind of media. And I, I get what you're saying, Nick. There's people who have like went to college and have a job and, and lined up an internship and are doing responsible things. Um, I, that's not really what's going on in this culture at this time, right? I mean, this is what's, you know, th- these people are living a kind of different life. 
Well, is there any character in the movie who is surprisingly successful and doing all those things? Well, yeah, well, who's successful is Madeline. Yes. Mm-hmm. Madeline's very successful. The um, one who is constantly being insulted by Paul, the one who is treated terribly by Paul, the one who is ignored by Paul. We're saying he can't connect to her, but he's not mm-hmm. trying at all. And then well, he's tr- trying. He's just that. Did he can't get there? Well, she's also pretty uh, stonewall oh, too. The, the musician, yeah, it would be tough yes. to connect with the musician, the magazine editor. I I think he, she, she she is pretty standoffish. She does yeah. pull him at an arm's length, um, mm-hmm. but he's also utterly unable to relate to her. And I yeah, I, I keep yeah. coming back to the question of is that him or is that a commentary on the culture? You know, are people utterly unable to relate to each other? And that's what the filmmaker is getting at. Yeah, I agree with Kat. I think these people are unable to relate to each other, especially across that that gender divide. Um, you know, I don't think it's, you know, I, I think Paul is trying everything. To, I mean, he proposes to her pretty, you know, he's proposing to her. Out of, out of uh, desperation, essentially. Out of desperation, yeah. I mean, he's shocked when he found that she went out to the country without him. With another um, guy. And Yeah, yeah. And also mm-hmm. that she becomes pregnant right around that time Mm -hmm. yeah yeah Yeah, they're they're just there's no way i mean his i mean if we're calling jerkiness it's also part of a sort of desperation he just can't get to this woman he loves um yeah and and she is you know growing in success right she has a record out it's it seems to be selling pretty well um you know but there just isn't there isn't an ability to connect. And I think that's what Paul's, what we might find frustrating about Paul is happening in the fact that he is frustrated that he can't relate to these people. Um, And to your point, Kevin, I think that is kind of a comment on the time, especially this kind of Mark's Pepsi or Mark's Coca-Cola thing. These are two things that are to a certain degree at odds with one another, right? There, There is sort of something inherently um, paradoxical about being the child of these two, what do you want to call it? These two ideologies, these two ways of thinking about the world, these two cultural influences, they are, they're not congruent. And it seems to bleed into the gender relations these people have. All right, here we are at the last question. We have, uh, oh, this really could be anybody's game. We have Kevin in the lead with three points, KJ with two and Nick with one. It's time for Question four. What does Paul tell the woman in the cafe to do before she shoots the man? Paul tells her to do something right before she pulls out a gun and shoots the man who's taking away the the child. He tells it to the woman who's about to shoot the guy? Yes. Mm -hmm. Locked in. I'll, I'll lock in, sure. Locked in. All right, Nick, what do you have? You forgot your purse. Okay. Kevin, what do you have? Uh, call the police. No, I feel like it's something far, mis- far more misogynistic than that, but I'll go with call the police. Okay, and KJ, what do you have? I have to admit, this joke worked for me. They set it up pretty well, and then this punchline was pretty good, but he points out that the door is still open. <laughs> yeah, indeed that's right um very good and that means kj has won the episode wow mm-hmm. very good it's, yeah. <laughs> nicely He's, done kj yeah he says close the door yeah. Yeah, the port, see the my port. face right now you'd see i'm thrilled that is a round two <laughs> victory right there from zero yeah, to yeah, winner yeah. oh yes very good so KJ, would you say that this win is emblematic of your passion for this movie <laughs> Uh, yes, yes, it most certainly is. Um, audience, let me know if you're going to watch this movie again. And if not, Tom has another movie that he recommends that I watched. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Did you not like that Goodbye to Language? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Guys, <laughs> Goodbye to Language compared to um, Masculine and Feminine, uh, it doesn't have any of the, uh, the racism and the sexism and the, the homophobic stuff. 
but it made so much less sense than masculine feminine. Oh, I thought it was a complete guide to this movie. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I thought that would help. I thought it would make it easier. I had no idea what was going on. I was way off. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, all right. Well, we could talk about that, I guess. Okay. Um, so I, I brought this this particular thing forward, the, the kind of... There's a lot of violence in the movie, actually, a decent amount of violence that is really bizarre. It's sort of inserted in here. Um, there's a, a French actor, uh, Michel de Halley, who in describing this movie said it's about the banality of atrocity. Um, and so we have a few atrocities. We have the man who stabs himself, who commits suicide in the arcade by just stabbing himself. We have this woman who shoots this person. We have another person who sets himself on fire to protest the Vietnam War. Um, we have the woman in the subway who fires a gun that we don't see if she points at anyone or if it, if it lands. Um, and yet all of this crime is kind of, it doesn't really lead anywhere, right? And I think the best embodiment of this is she pulling out a gun to shoot a guy and he says, the door, the door, close the door. Um, and I was wondering what you guys thought of the, the banality of atrocity. Even the intertitles, weren't they like gunshots? Yeah, 15 Precise Facts, which is the subtitle of this movie. Masculine, feminine, 15 Precise Facts. I thought you were going to ask us how many intertitles there were, and I was going to say 15, and I was going to win. <laughs> I don't know if there are. The they, last there one says are... 15. Yeah, I know, but there is. A... I'm, I don't think there's 15 facts. Oh. I don't think they make good on that promise. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't, I don't think all of, I, I could be wrong here, but do all of the cuts have those um those sort of title boards that come up so, as i remember a, a few of them maybe i just wasn't um paying attention enough but i remember a few of them being like wait how does this relate to the scene that just happened and and, mm. and of course the answer is it doesn't they don't except in the in the over except in the big arc of the movie right he's even choppy in a scene like he'll cut and you'll see the scene, people jump and move places. For example, when they were in the laundromat, he's mid dialogue, but he's clearly jumping to different parts of the room. <laughs> so mm. very, very, that really jumped out at me how jumpy it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it kind of almost had a house vibe, I'd say, the movie House. And he, mm -hmm. does, with, he does the same thing with the uh, soundtrack too. He, he's. Um, there's no ceremony to when he's going to be playing music and not playing music. Um, and I, I did kind of enjoy how choppy it was, actually, if I had to pick mm -hmm. something to, to like about this movie. See, KJ, you may like what I'm about to say next. I enjoyed House more than this film. Wow. <laughs> uh, I like House a lot, but I love this movie. So I'm like, <laughs> I, I don't know if I can, I can agree. It's time for movie rent i don't i like i there's a bunch of scenes that i really was interested in so i'm interested in the the dutchman scene when they're on the train the woman is on the train with the two black men um which is a paraphrase it's hard to explain it's a paraphrase of a play called dutchman by uh leroy jones who later changed his name to amira bakara um and it's about it's a play that explores racism and it's about a a woman a white woman and a black man and the white woman ends up killing the black man and actually in the scene do you remember the scene with bridget bardot no okay Go so there's on. there's a, there's a scene remember there's a, a what scene, does she do there's two people in a cafe and one of them is in a very attractive blonde woman and the other guy is like teaching her how to a read scene like yeah. read a scene okay. yeah Br bridget bardot oh, yeah, was yeah. extremely famous actress back then the person she's talking to is uh, uh, um Anthony Borsellia, who directed that play, Dutchman, in France at that time. And actually, if you get the French translation of Dutchman, he's the one who did the, the translation of it. Um, and so there's this kind of odd reference to this American play about race relations, which they just sort of do a scene from it in a, in a train um, for some reason. I mean, it's really... A really odd scene. I don't know what to do with it. But I think that's what. So I, I'm. 
I think it's a, really about the failure of communication. That's sort of what this movie's about. But there's a bunch of like things that happen in the movie that I think are really fascinating, but I don't get. And one of them is that, that there's this scene from this play, this incredibly popular play at the time, that's just in the middle of this movie. That's just occurring in the movie as if it's not not a play, just an event that Paul stumbles upon. And I don't, <laughs> I don't know what to make of it. And it's the same thing with Paul's death, right? Like, um, and I guess it has something to do with the, what, what this, this French director and actor was saying. It's like, there's this sort of, uh, the, the society's filled with these atrocities. Um, and what's so sad about them is that they're so casual. They just happen all over the place, um, you know? And yeah. Or like, why is Bridget Bardot in this movie? You know what I mean? Like why is she, I don't know. Why not? She, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, she was like the big, big actress at that time. Uh, and for years after, and even now she's kind of a legend. Um, Criterion had a few months ago, a Bridget Bardot, like film release, that type of thing. Um, but I, I just, yeah, I guess I find so much of this, like you guys seem to really not like Paul very much. <laughs> and, no, you know, I didn't I, like I, him at all. Oh yeah. I really, I actually really like him. Um, yeah. Part of, part of it is, uh, um uh leo is a just an actor i happen to like a lot i just love looking at him i think he has a fascinating face and uh how he responds to things um the, the sort of kind of nervousness he has in this movie uh which actually truffaut who discovered him francois truffaut who discovered him sort of yelled at godard about after he saw this movie truffaut was like you made him uncomfortable why how dare you make him uncomfortable but uh, leo who was actually 21 when he made this was discovered when he was 14 by by truffaut and they made a film called the the 400 blows um yeah but i yeah, I, I suppose I just had a very different reaction to this movie <laughs> than you guys did. Uh, and what I what I wanted to talk about, I guess maybe a little more was why it was so weird. Like, why like why do we have this guy commit suicide in the uh, in that arcade area and things like that? Um, but that's fine. I mean, you know, we don't have to go into it. Anymore. Yeah, I mean, I I think mm. I think that the banality of it is 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 the right word, but I think it's just this uh I, I think the wondering why is the point right mm -hmm. it's it's why would this violence just happen right and th that's the question and that's the question that you're asking about this specific scene but it's also the question that i think you're asking about vietnam or um you know fascist regimes or capitalist societies for that matter why where did that come from why why did this person end up suffering there doesn't seem to be a good reason for it and mm -hmm. i think that's kind of the point yeah that makes sense to me in, in communication like lack of communication this the senseless the senselessness of it and the the the, the wondering why mm -hmm. why this all happens um, mm -hmm. I think that's that's the point. What was the whole end sequence? So he mysteriously died, suicide, got killed. Like that was weird. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, the end is one of the things. So my reading of this movie is it is about um, like this young man who just can't get, who can't cross this divide, right? Who can't communicate. It's about this like impossibility of communicating. Um, but there's all of this stuff that happens that. I, I don't quite get one of them is the ending. So for our audience, the movie ends with Madeline speaking to a police officer um, about what happened to Paul, who has apparently inherited an apartment from his or inherited money from his mother, which he used to buy an apartment. And according to her, he just fell out a window when trying to take a picture and died. And she's pregnant and she doesn't know what to do. Um, uh, the uh, uh, shower rod. That yeah, was quite solution. disturbing too. I'm not sure. Yeah. Maybe a shower rod. I'm not sure. It was yeah, yeah. Which is how they filmed that scene. Is um, she wore an earpiece and Godard whispered the lines into her ear, and she didn't know what he was going to say. So that was how a lot of that's how all of the scenes were really done. Really, but um, uh, yeah, it's interesting. That's yeah. Um, 
but and this also was her first movie she had not been an actor before but um anyway so what was i saying i completely lost we're my just trying thing. to figure oh, the out ending. what the heck is going on with the ending yeah the ending is one of those things i just don't i honestly i'm not entirely sure what i'm supposed to make of it any <laughs> any uh any work you want to do on that no that's why i brought it up because mm. i'm at a loss myself it's very mm. random i mean i guess he was done with showing us random sequences <laughs> and said okay this will mm. tie it all up but i'd like to think that i'm just missing something i i think it's very plausible that she killed him like e- extremely plausible like i don't so i think in the scene, the one thing that you're fairly sure of is it didn't happen the way that they said it happened. Um, like you don't you don't know how it actually happened, but you're pretty sure they're lying. Um, uh, both both of these women, and, and in in my head, I guess I I go back to that conversation where you know they're going to the country with this other guy, and she becomes pregnant at about the same time, and maybe something about that comes out um, where paternity is questioned in, in some fashion. And um, I think that sort of brings the, what are you gonna do about the baby thing into focus? Um, because I, I, in my mind, there was always some ambiguity about the paternity of the baby. I don't know if anybody else thought that, but um, that was always something that was present in my mind. And I, I thought, oh, when they ended the movie on what are you gonna do about the baby? I thought, okay. I'm onto something here. Um, mm-hmm. I, I'm not just making this up. I feel like this is something that um, the filmmakers meant to convey. I didn't get that when I watched it, but after you're saying this, I could buy into that. Yeah, the, the baby is first mentioned in the cafe, and I think it's her. Uh, it's her roommate, whose name I always forget. Uh, Marlene. Uh, excuse me, Elizabeth. Um, and Elizabeth, you know, kind of mentions that, oh, no, he mentions he's worried she's pregnant. Elizabeth says she's very careful. She always takes her temperature before you know, going to bed with you. Um, no, I, I, got, I got the impression that um, it was like, hey, she wouldn't, she wouldn't get pregnant by accident, at least not with you. Yeah, yeah, was yeah. the way I took that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Okay. That makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, and, should, and she, I feel like the roommate sort of opens the door to like, well, look, there is a lot of opportunity for something untoward to happen here. Mm-hmm. And, and then um, Paul gets really angry and starts yelling at her and mm-hmm. then says like, well, you know, of course she wouldn't do that. She's pregnant. Mm-hmm. And it's like, yeah, but that argument's circular, right? You see how that <laughs> doesn't, doesn't work. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I, I don't know. So I, mm-hmm. I, I always, or always, since this afternoon when I watched the movie, um, I, I tied that scene to the ending mm-hmm. and sort of the ambiguity of both scenes I thought was intended. And I don't know mm-hmm. what to make of that necessarily, but I thought those scenes were, were connected and that the ambiguity was, was meant to be there. That's kind of funny. So I thought the roommate was saying she said she's pregnant, but she's not to keep him around because he said, hey, will you marry me? She's like, "Eh, let's talk about it later. And then she's like, well, I still want to keep him around. So I'll say I'm pregnant to buy me some more time. And then the end of the movie, when the cop's like, what are you going to do? I thought it was just like a smirk on her face. Like, oh, I don't know. Like, I got out of my lie. I don't have to worry about it anymore. Yeah, I, I think there's a distinct possibility that she was never pregnant. That's that's mm-hmm. totally possible. I took it the way KJ did, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on that too, because maybe I'm wrong, which I wouldn't be surprised if I was wrong on anything with this film. I think all of the violence in the movie is just sort of part of life, I think is the idea. Like it's it's not this separate thing from what we experience day to day that that violence is is in in the world, um, and it's actually fairly boring. It's just a kind of part of the day to day. It's probably happening not too far from wherever you are, and it seemed like the death of Paul was that Paul, despite 
and the fact that he's the center of this world we've been with for uh, however long this movie is an hour and a half he's just suddenly snuffed out right the, like and it, and it's seems kind of random and we don't even know really what happened then i could kind of buy any argument right that she was somehow responsible probably not in a in a deliberate way but maybe in a in a fit of frustration with him um or he actually did just fall out a window or he committed suicide because he was upset you know like i i really could buy anything and i think it's just the the violent things that happen in this movie um they don't offer us understanding about the world All right there's the guy who burns himself to death for for vietnam and they're like no he didn't but i would have heard someone screaming he's like well he taped his mouth I'm like that's crap and then she goes over there and comes back and it's like yeah i guess, guess he did <laughs> you know <laughs> or the guy who's like paul upsets him and he comes at him with the knife and then he just commits suicide and there's no real reason for it there's no justification it's just the, the, these kind of horrors just sort of filter through the world. Yeah, and no consequence either, either in the world or in the film. Yeah, yeah. There's no, there's no justification. There's no consequence. Yeah, um, and I, I, yeah. I guess it's that's kind of maybe the tragedy that they are not only are these people like Paul and Madeline disconnected from each other. Um, everybody's kind of disconnected from the consequences. And ultimately, I guess, if you you stretch it into the political, right, it's these kind of political actors are disconnected from the consequences of the things they're doing in Vietnam or, or wherever. Um, and yeah, that would be the ultimate sphere. But I, I think we're living in a world about, um, in a world without consequences, which has a lot of fun to it, right? There's the kind of uh, joie de vivre sort of feel, but it's also kind of horrible <laughs> in some ways because people just die or violence just happens. And talking about feeling disconnected, as the victor of this episode, I would like to, uh, you know, I think we should just move right on to, you can find more of our content wherever you listen to our podcast on our YouTube channel, Twitter at Talking Studios, and our website, TalkingPicturesTrivia.com. We are extremely grateful for all those who subscribe, like, follow, and leave a review. Do you wish you could go back to 1965 France? Why or why not? Let us know on Twitter, TalkingPicturesTrivia at gmail.com, or give us a call at 201-467-8679. Thanks again, Kevin, for joining us today. Hey, thanks, guys. Yeah, it's always fun. Even when the movie is... Uh... Difficult. <laughs> you can find me on Twitter at Thomas Lehman 15 and check out Talking Pictures Trivia at B-Side. You can find me on Twitter at KJ1000. I can also be found on Twitter at The Nicknamed. Join us next time when we continue to exploit. Let's try it again. Exploit? Exploit? Join us next time when we continue to explore that era and discuss Tom's recommendation from 1928 speedy stay tuned for our first impressions of this film ding 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 next week we'll be discussing speedy tom how was your watch i like this movie a lot harold lloyd gets a back seat and everybody knows this harold lloyd gets a back seat to buster keaton and charlie chaplin even though he made more movies than the two of them combined and he is a somewhat different comedian he is a bit early on in his career in the in the chaplain shadow he has a character very early on his his one reeler is called lonesome luke who is it i it looks like a charlie chaplin ripoff a tramp ripoff and he, he broke out on his own once he sort of found the glasses character the horn rimmed glasses character i don't know if this is his best movie uh safety last always seems to get that designation and that seems to to make sense to me however in terms of our block the that era block i think this movie captures the, an image of new york from the 1920s in spite of the fact that it's really itself sort of nostalgic for an older new york but so much of new york you see on screen that actually was 
was real, not just a set. And so for our purposes, for this block, I felt this movie captured the city, not only literally, but it also had that kind of boisterous energy, as well as a respect for locality. And we lose a little bit of that today in Manhattan. I mean, it's still true to some degree, but especially back then, the city is not just this thing stepping out onto the world stage, but it's also this collection of localities. And I felt the movie captured that aspect of the era. And I'm really excited to talk about it with you guys next week. Chris, how was your first watch? Uh, I really enjoyed this movie. This is actually the first silent film I've ever watched from beginning to end. I've, of course, seen snippets of all kinds of, you know, Charlie Chaplin work. But this is the first one that I've seen from beginning to end that I sat down and watched in one take. And I must admit, I really enjoyed it. And then to, to go off what you said, I really liked that peek into an era of Manhattan that I hadn't seen before other than in like dramatic, you know, we're going to recreate this. This looked real. Uh, and I, I did really enjoy it, and I, I look forward to talking about it as well. What about you, KJ? Yeah, this was the first time I had heard of Speedy, um, and this is the first time I had heard of Harold Lloyd, Tom. Like you say, I, I had no idea. Uh, you could kind of tell he must have been famous. Like, he, he knew what he was doing on screen. It was not his first time on screen. Um, it looked like he had standard shticks that he was doing. Um, but I watched the first 10 minutes, and I was cracking up pretty good. I was really enjoying it. But then it kind of got into a sitcom rhythm, it felt like to me. Um, and I could just hear a sitcom laugh track playing every time a, a joke was punctuated. So it made it a little bit less enjoyable. But I think that's me, audience, not Harold. So I think you'll enjoy it. Um, and Tom like saying, New York looked beautiful. Coney Island looked amazing. Dangerous, but amazing. How about you, Nick? This was also my first watch. And in fact, my first watch of anything that Harold Lloyd was in or did. And I really enjoyed it. I felt like it was not a, or I should say he's not as slapsticky as Chaplin, but you could see that there might've been some influences or that's just how these were done in that time frame. But I did enjoy it. And just like we were saying about the city, I've, I've mentioned this in other episodes. I really like when movies are time capsules of a certain period of time. And that was a New York in the flesh. Like Chris said, not a recreation of what New York looked like back then. That was it. And what I found really interesting was when you saw parts of the city that you could actually like see now, <laughs> it was really cool. And of course, things that have changed with the, you know, horseless trolleys not even being around, let alone a horse drawn one. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, talking about this one next week. Speedy is available on Criterion Channel and on HBO Max at the time of this recording.